poverty. So um, I'd just like to start by asking wh why this, what we had in the title, making the right decisions to secure the future of work, including through digital technologies, should be urgent for, for African policymakers. Um, so you see that we emphasize the high number of poor people, the growing youth population. Those make it imperative to take actions to make sure that Africa's digital future is actually inclusive, uh, to invest in the kinds of technologies that will create better jobs for less skilled workers as well. Um, digital technology adoption doesn't necessarily have to be inclusive, and it, it's, it's sort of a conditional statement. It may be inclusive as long as policymakers put in place the right environment. Uh, so, you know, as, as Jean-Claude mentioned, uh, we, in, in many developed countries, we see the benefits uh, um, you know, from adopting skill-biased technologies like the internet being skewed towards people who are higher skilled. Uh, so policymakers must ensure from the beginning that the adoption of digital technologies reduce rather than worsen the digital divide. It's not automatic. Um, and we, we also mentioned global risks emanating from climate shocks, from fragility, from economic integration, from population transitions. They're also transforming the work landscape and lend an urgency to more inclusive technology adoption. And finally, uh, the recent interest by African policymakers in digital technologies provides an entry point. It's, it's sort of a, a window of opportunity to broaden the policy debate, to facilitate all types of technology adoption that are complementary to digital as part of uh, what we term an inclusive productivity growth agenda. Uh, we like to say that uh, Africa uh, can't really benefit from the Internet of Things without actually having the complementary things as well. Uh, so, you know, African farmers clearly need uh, better tractors. They need better irrigation systems. Uh, they actually need not just the tangible things like tractors and irrigation systems, but they need the intangible things like better management capabilities. Uh, and so, uh, focusing on digital technologies also importantly serves as an entry point to a broader policy discussion on all complementary types of technology adoption to digital. Um, in this report, we claim that Africa has an opportunity to develop a more inclusive future of work agenda with opportunities for lower skilled workers. Uh, wh why do we make this claim? So it's, it's a conditional claim. It depends on policymakers creating the right environment. But there are a number of structural characteristics that really are about low income and fragile countries. Uh, and many of which happen to be in, in sub-Saharan Africa that we list here, sort of the low level of technology adoption, uh, only 8% of employment on average in manufacturing, uh, low levels of consumption, especially of higher quality food products and other services, low levels of education and skills, um, almost 90% of total employment in the informal sector, most of it in agriculture. Uh, so what are three important possible reasons why the future of work uh, may play out differently in Africa. So this is sort of the crux of my part of the presentation. Um, a first reason comes from the supply side of product markets. So there's a lower chance of losing jobs from automation because there's actually been little automation to date. Manufacturing is very small. Uh, most workers are in the informal sector. Uh, the adoption of sort of worker replacing digital technologies like robots is, is not likely to displace many people over the next few years. So there is a window of opportunity there. So that's the first claim. Uh, a second possible reason has to do from the demand side of product markets. So uh, where do jobs come from, generating jobs? It comes from uh, firms producing more. That comes from consumers buying more. So demand arguably could be much more elastic, more responsive to the price reductions that are expected to come from adoption of digital technologies and other technologies. Uh, so in contrast to developed countries where there's already close to satiation in certain specific types of products, in Africa there's a lot of pent up demand for higher quality foodstuffs, for higher quality services. So the price reductions are expected to make these products affordable for mass consumption, and therefore that should allow for sufficiently large increases in production uh, to create more jobs, provided those products are actually competitively produced in Africa. And then the third opportunity, and I, I actually think this is the most interesting, uh, comes from uh, what we could call worker enhancing rather than worker replacing, uh, 
low-skill biased digital technologies rather than skill biased. So uh, what are those kinds of things? Um, if you think of what digital allows uh, one to do, allows firms to do, allows people to do, it, it provides video, it provides voice, it makes very quick, easy mathematical calculations. So it's precisely, it should be helpful for people with low literacy and low numeracy skills. So you could think of voice and video-based e-extension services for farms and for firms. You could think of different kinds of mobile payment systems for the unbanked that are really easy to access, much easier than otherwise. You could think of, like was mentioned, Uber-like platforms that don't require, like, so when you have an Uber-like platform, the person providing the service doesn't have to make the calculation of how much change to give back. Um, so these should, in principle, provide um, economic opportunities for the lower income, lower educated, lower skilled workers, uh, provided the business environment is there to provide the incentives for entrepreneurs to actually produce those kinds of apps and in an affordable way for low-skilled people to actually want to adopt them. So I wanted to just present one piece of evidence about uh, what we know so far about these types of more inclusive benefits. So this is a study that was published in the American Economic Review this spring. Uh, and it was able to identify causal impacts rather than just correlations. It takes advantage of faster internet when new areas became connected to 10 different undersea cables at different times in the late 2000s and two, to 2010s, and that greatly increased the speed uh, and capacity of, ter of terrestrial networks. So the likelihood that a worker is employed increased by over 3% in South Africa, over 7% in these eight countries that are part of the survey reported, and then there were similar results found in an Afrobarometer survey across nine other countries. Um, so these findings were then broken down by occupation. And so you see in the top one, skilled versus unskilled, you see that, in fact, predictably, uh, since internet is a skill-biased digital technology, uh, it combines better sort of with more skilled people, the probability of holding a skilled job increased relative to the unskilled. And then in the second little clump, you see uh, that it's the moderately skilled occupations that contributed the most to the increase in jobs. But what I want to bring your attention to is the last clump, and especially where we circled it in red, uh, where they examined the impact on workers by educational attainment. And it turns out they found that increases in employment rates were of similar magnitude for primary educated people uh, at the same level as secondary and tertiary. So this is quite an important finding. It raises questions regarding what is driving this. Uh, it could, for instance, be that uh, what secondary and tertiary schooling teaches relative to primary is not that useful for some businesses, and they prefer training these workers right after completing primary school. Clearly, more work is needed to understand the channels through which this is occurring, uh, but it highlights you know, that skilled workers will still benefit more from skill-biased technologies. And then there's this whole agenda that this doesn't look at, is what would be the impact of the low skill-biased uh, digital technologies, like, like the, uh, the voice-based and the video-based uh, e-extension services. So lots to do still in this area to better understand. And finally, before handing off to Zainab, um, I just wanted to uh, set the stage for uh, you know, what are the right questions for, for Africa? Sort of, um, in our report, we focus on four areas, which are very linked, again, to the areas that uh, Jean-Claude mentioned. That is, the digital technologies and the required infra digital infrastructure, linked, of course, with the electricity infrastructure, human capital, informality, and social protection. And so I just want to emphasize what some of the most novel features in each of these four areas are before uh, Zainab goes in more detail. So in the first area, we argue that improving the availability of affordable internet is a prerequisite, you know, without which the adoption of any other technologies that sort of ride on the internet uh, can't be provided. Uh, we emphasize the potential benefits from regional harmonization. So supported by sort of increased regulatory capacity through regional hubs. So rather than having each of the 48 sub-Saharan African countries each having uh, quite difficult regulatory expertise, quite complicated, uh, why not have, for instance, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda as a starting point uh, come together uh, and, and then think jointly about sort of uh, would it make sense to have things like um, regional spectrum auctions, holding 
auctions at the same time across three countries, and then uh, allowing ex post trading again across the region or asset sharing across the region. So, uh, and, and think of different experiments happening to see how to do this better since it's so important. In the second area on human capital, we argue that the challenge involves both a large stock of low-skilled workers and the flow of youth, and that it'll be important to provide an appropriate business environment for entrepreneurs to develop these uh, solutions for lower-skilled workers to learn as they work. In the third area on informality, we argue that there has to be a shift from traditional formalization policies to policies that actually help uh, boost the productivity of informal firms and firms and their workers. And so as the successful firms grow, they'll naturally want to seek formal services and become formalized. And finally, in the last area, we argue for a, a rebalancing of government and development partner expenditures in line with the structure of labor markets. So I'll now uh, switch uh, and let uh, Zainab finish uh, by going more in detail in these areas. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and thanks to Mark for providing that uh, good uh, introduction. Um, as he mentioned, there are four key areas we cover in the report, which we identify as uh, key pillars that will support or that can support the digital transformation across African countries. <clears throat> so the first pillar is uh, digital technologies, and here we emphasize uh, inclusive digital technologies which, as Mark explained, are technologies that are worker-enhancing, but they also are, they can be used by uh, lower-skilled workers. So we actually argue that there are two key reasons why uh, low-skilled workers across African countries will benefit from these digital technologies. The first, and, and these two key reasons are illustrated by um, this uh, uh, diagram uh, on the slide, which looks very complicated, but I promise you there's a very simple logic to it. So the first reason is that, um, um, you know, across many African countries, the key sectors that are susceptible to automation, such as manufacturing and other industries, actually constitute a small share of national employment, and this was, in a sense, alluded to by Mark. Across many African countries, you find that uh, the manufacturing sector, for example, contributes less than 10% of national employment. And if you look at the figure on the slide, um, there's an orange dotted line. The space covered by that area represents the employment that will be displaced by automation in these African countries, and it's a very small area. Compared to the area covered by the blue line, which represents you know, uh, lost employment to uh, automation in these sectors in high-income countries and OECD countries. So basically, we're not going to see that massive displacement of labor in such sectors as manufacturing. Um, the second reason why low-skilled workers across African countries are likely to benefit from digital technologies is that these digital innovations allow for the uh, creation of new products and a whole new category of subsectors um, across um, uh, African countries with, with associated jobs. So you find that in many African countries, um, entrepreneurs can and will um, create uh, digital solutions in, in sectors such as uh, retail, such as agriculture, such as education, and a whole range of other services. Um, and importantly, with these digital solutions, you find that uh, a lot of people can use them, but they can also learn in the process, as, as Mark explained. Um, the second key pillar for us is human capital. And a key question that we address in this report is what area or what areas of human capital should be prioritized uh, to enable and to support the digital transformation in African countries? So um, we, we, we summarize evidence in the report such as uh, that represented by you know, the figure on the slide, which shows that across many African countries in big countries such as Nigeria, in Guinea, in Mali, et cetera, um, many adults, um, actually up to 40% or even more than 40% of adults are basically illiterate. They cannot read, they have little or no numeracy and literacy skills. So we argue that um, 
uh, in, in many of such countries, the human capital challenges involve uh, two things. So there's a large stock of low skilled workers and there's also a continuous flow of people into the labor market. And what do we mean by this? So in terms of the large stock of low skilled workers, about 60% of the labor force in many, many countries are adults who are ill-equipped for jobs. And uh, you know, added to this stock is the fact that every year you have young people, you have people joining the labor market who are similarly ill-equipped. Um, you know, according to some figures, up to 11 million people join the labor market each year in African countries. So when we think of solutions to these human capital challenges, we uh, need to think about also focusing on the stock and flows and how to increase their numeracy and literacy skills. And certainly digital solutions can help in that regard. So the third key pillar is that we also need to, generally there needs to be a focus on increasing informal sector productivity. So uh, before we launch into that discussion, a key, uh, we, I, I would like to highlight some key features of the informal sector in African countries. So first of all, it is very large and um, you know, about 90% of, uh, it constitutes about 90% of total employment in many countries. I mean, of course, these varies across uh, different countries on the continent. The second key feature is that it is mostly in agriculture. And the third key feature is that it comprises, and this is very surprising, even for us, you know, when we were working on this, that it comprises of not just small firms, as you would think, it's not just the petty trader, you know. Uh, it's also large firms, fairly large firms, that operate in informality and in the informal sector. So one of our key arguments, really, is that um, policies that have traditionally focused on formalization have not been that effective, they've not been that impactful across many African countries. And therefore we need a different approach. And what is that approach? The, approach, the new approach is that we need to focus on improving the productivity of uh, the informal sector. So what it also means is that the traditional formalization policies, we should continue with them, but we need to be more focused in what we do with them. That is, we need to target those large informal firms that aggressively compete and sometimes undermine formal firms in the economy. So in an effort to increase this informal sector productivity, digital solutions can also help. So they can help with increasing access to information and to credit markets. They can help increase financial inclusion, to build skills, etc. Um, and you find that when firms become more productive, when they grow, then formalization becomes a more organic and natural process. Um, so the fourth key pillar and the last one that we focus on in the report is the need to extend social protection coverage. We all know how important social protection is in terms of mitigating risks for individuals, but enabling them to also take on more risk and become entrepreneurs, as well as the poverty reduction dimension. Uh, unfortunately, across many African countries, um, social protection coverage is very, very low compared to many other regions across the world, as this figure on the chart illustrates. So you find that eight in 10 uh, people in African countries are not covered by a safety net, they're not under any pension scheme, and they're not just covered by any social protection and labor policy. Um, so this reality then motivates one of our key recommendations in the report that uh, social protection and labor policies should seek to align with the current structure of labor markets in African countries. So the, this means that you know, uh, social protection spending by governments and by also importantly by development partners should be rebalanced to cover people, especially informal workers, and those in transition. And you know, the word transition is very, very important because in a situation where you have an economy that is changing rapidly, as with quite a number of African countries, people move across jobs from, urban, from rural to urban areas, from small urban centers to larger urban centers, across industries, 
across sectors, but importantly, across borders. And we're all aware of you know, the Africa continental free trade area as illustrative of attempts to increase regional and economic integration. So, you know, social protection is needed to um, uh, provide, a, 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 to mitigate risks for, for, for such individuals. So this rebalancing that we propose and that we advocate for, we believe can be achieved by three key things or in three key ways. So first of all, uh, by improving revenue collection more broadly. Secondly, by improving the efficiencies of current allocations of social spending, using instruments such as public expenditure reviews to find out where the inefficiencies are and to do the rebalancing. And finally, uh, there's also a need to effectively coordinate development assistance. In many African countries, social protection is provided by development partners. Um, finally, and this is the concluding slide, um, what should be done? What should governments do? But I think this also refers to other stakeholders in addition to government, so development partners and just key stakeholders you know, in, um, who are invested in this. Um, and really, we conclude, as you know, Mark has already alluded to, on a very positive note that the future of work in Africa is positive, is going to be positive, but this is really conditional on the right decisions being made by governments, but by also other key stakeholders. And what are these right decisions? We summarize them as three Cs, and also three Cs are a bit catchy, we couldn't resist it. Um, so these three Cs are capital, capacity, and competition, and I'll quickly walk you through them. In terms of capital, um, our key message is that uh, you know, businesses and enterprises, sure, they need financial resources, but they really need more than that to be able to, uh, to expand in existing markets and enter new ones. They need better human capital for entrepreneurs, but also for workers. But they also need physical capital and infrastructure, as our executive director um, you know, so eloquently and passionately explained. They need uh, you know, uh, reliable electricity and transport networks. Not much really can be done without electricity. And I come from Nigeria. I know all the challenges and all the bad jokes about <laughs> power outages. Um, so businesses uh, need that, uh, as well as digital infrastructure, so internet, broadband, um, inter um, and, and you know, things like that. Secondly, uh, there's a need to increase the capacity of governments to make the needed investments in social protection. And this specifically is meant to allow for greater risk taken by entrepreneurs. So currently, you know, people might want to move across borders. They want to, may, may want to establish a, you know, uh, you know, an outlet somewhere, but it's very difficult because of all the risks that people face, uh, weak insurance markets and things like that. Um, also to, to support uh, workers to transition across and between jobs. Finally, is the need to promote competition. Um, and this entails perhaps two key things. Upstream competition in the provision of the very infrastructure that we mentioned, electricity, transportation, and digital infrastructure, but also to allow businesses adopt new technologies and expand production. So really, uh, to conclude, uh, we do believe that the future of work in Africa is bright. Personally, I'm very optimistic about Africa. So many young entrepreneurs, so many women, some of the friends that I went to high school with, you know, people doing amazing things. But we, as you know, development partners, as governments, we also need to support these people to make uh, the future of work in Africa bright. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.